This is the Wealth Junkie Show. Brought to you by CEO Capital Partners, Brendan Dukeman and Will Harvey. Your hosts deliver the daily fix you're looking for with exciting wealth building secrets and strategies for what's working today. Listen to real life stories straight from the mouths of some of the hottest, most successful entrepreneurs and financial freedom seekers to fuel your success addiction. What's going on, junkies? Thanks for joining back with us on the Daily Wealth Junkie Show. I'm Brandon Dukeman here with Will Harvey, and we've got a great show in store for you today. Uh, before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the show on uh, whatever platform you're listening to this to, iTunes, uh, whatever it may be, and uh, join us on Facebook. At the end of the show, we'll give you the link to the Facebook uh, group. Um, and uh, without further ado, we're going to let Will Harvey introduce our best uh, guest today. Yeah, thanks so much, Brandon. So today we have a really, really exciting episode. We have uh, Steve Sims with us. And Steve is the founder of Bluefish, which is one of the top personal concierge services. Um, He's an avid expert marketer within the luxury industry. Steve's been quoted in various publications and TV, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, London's Sunday Times, South China Morning Post, and many more. Um, he's actually worked with Elton John and Elon Musk. He's a best-selling author, author with Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. That's the name of his book. And he is a sought-after consultant and speaker at a variety of networks, groups, and associations, as well as the Pentagon and Harvard, and he's spoken there twice. So um, there's a lot more I could, I could read about, but I will just uh, I'll let him jump in and uh and steve why don't you give the listeners your your background and what got you to where you are today wow is this a four-day show um <laughs> it's uh well look you know I, I we can name drop we can talk about fantastic faraway cities and stuff like that but the bottom line of it is i was a diseased dysfunctional entrepreneur like all of us um i was raised in uh, east london uh, hence my uh, um, smooth accent. And I was a son of a bricklaying family. So I came out of school at the age of 15 and was kicked out of bed early and told, right, you're going to be working on a building site. As a young lad, I was like, is this my life? Is this it? And as an entrepreneur, the answer was no, it can't be. So I did what all entrepreneurs do. We bounce off a wall, it's just like we were talking about before get into trouble, get some scrapes, fall over, stand up, fall over again, because we didn't know how to find our feet. We didn't know where to fit. Um, I kept on trying to find something to challenge and engage me. Um, I wanted to hang around with rich people because poor people couldn't afford good food or good drinks. And I knew that (laughs) because I was one of those. So I started hanging around with rich people, um, trying to find out what made them rich. Um, And, you know, it's led me to where I am today. I'm, as I say, started off in East London, moved to Hong Kong, um, Bangkok, Geneva, Palm Beach. And now I'm sitting here in Los Angeles, sending people down to the Titanic, closing down museums in Florence, uh, getting Andrea Bocelli to serenade you while you eat your pasta, um, walking down Oscar parties with Elton John, walking through SpaceX with Elon Musk, hanging out with Richard Branson and Oprah Winfrey. So it's been a very entertaining wild little road that got me there but now i am the guy that people call to either consult and work with their businesses or to make the magic happen for rather big checkbooks yeah that's wow. you got a lot of magic that you work there Ta- tell us a little bit about how you how you got to that point where you could make that magic happen and build those yeah companies. so As a bricklayer, I wanted the polar opposite of what my day was. And my day was being covered in crap, you know, getting wet, getting dirty. Um, I wanted the opposite of that. Um, I had a friend of mine that was a a trader in London. This was in the 80s. Excuse me. And uh, he was telling me that they were doing a mass exodus of trainees and established traders over to Hong Kong because Hong Kong was now the new booming market. Um, I went in for an interview wearing my dad's suit that was falling off my shoulders. And <laughs> I, had, I had a bank account. That was the closest I had to any relationship, to any financial knowledge. I had a checking account. So I knew nothing. Did but you they, have any money in the checking account? Oh, no, of course not. No, you know, it was all spent at the pub on a Friday night. And then you bitched and moaned until you could get paid again the following Friday. Um, but uh, I, I walked 
I walked into this uh, room, knew straight away I wasn't going to get the job, but they were sending so many people over. I actually got covered in with the crowd and they gave me the job along with, I think it was about 120 other people. Um, and they flew us all over to Hong Kong. Uh, we landed on the Saturday. I went out, went drinking with them because I was qualified at that. Um, on the Sunday, went drinking with them again, still qualified. Uh, on the Monday, did orientation with them for the first day of the new trading desk in Hong Kong. Come Tuesday morning, they realized I had no idea what I was doing, and they fired me. So, <laughs> wow. My, my trading job, my Wall Street vision lasted 24 hours. Um, oh, that is hilarious. I'm stuck, in, I'm stuck in Hong Kong. I uh, didn't know what to do. They, because they had brought me over, I had the apartment for three months. And I'm a great believer that sometimes the greatest thing to happen to you is for you to be able to fall over, okay? Because then you yeah. get empowered when you stand up again. And I'm in Hong Kong. My wife is in England. Um, she's thinking I'm going to bigger and better things. I'm unemployed. They gave me this apartment. The guys in the apartment hated me because they thought I was a fraud. I, I tried to explain to my boys, I wanted more the, for my life. Can you not see that? But they just looked at me like a fraud. So I would go out every single night and go back to the apartment at eight o'clock in the morning when they had gone to work. I would sleep during the day and then I'd go out again at night just so there wasn't any friction of, of us bumping into each other. So, you know, being a big, ugly lad, um, eventually I got asked to work on the door of one of these seedy little clubs that I was at. And of course, I could only afford seedy clubs. Um, but I started to see some affluent people coming in. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, that horrible um, club and that being stood on the door waiting for someone to try and throw a punch at me gave me a great pedestal to watch human nature. And I could see the people walk to my club and walk away because it was seedy. I could see the group of guys that were out celebrating a night. I could see the guys that wanted a bit of a punch up and were just looking to get a couple of beers in them to make it happen. I could see the girls out on the pool, the girls out on the hen nights, the girls out celebrating birthdays, promotions. It gave me a great um, vision point. And from there... I started playing games. And you may have done this. You're sitting in a restaurant and you look around the restaurant and you go, okay, who's on a first date? Mm -hmm. You know, who's celebrating yeah. the anniversary? You know, and I used to, because I'm an inquisitive Irish little annoying child. And now I'm still that. I'm just 53. Um, but I will literally be, whether it's at a bus stop, whether I'll be at a bagel store, it's just to keep my mind busy. But I'll be like, okay, I wonder if you've got any money, you know? What's the tells? You know, I remember working, uh, and again, through my, through my life, I started off as being a doorman. Then I started on the, on the low nights going, hey, give me the club on a Tuesday night. It's a low night, and I'll split the door with you. Okay? Now, the owner screwed me over, and I never made any money. But I, like you were saying earlier, I made a crap lot of experience from learning this. And you don't learn how to write the contract right until you write it wrong and get screwed. You know, that's, right. that's exactly that's you learn how to keep your guard up on your chin until you get a punch in the chin. Exactly. So I am a serial failure. I'm a complete mess up. And that's what's got me to where I am because I've never cared of those failings. And I started throwing the nightclubs, then realized I was getting screwed over. Didn't care because I was getting the education. We spoke about this earlier, Brendan. And then, you know, I started throwing parties on boats, yachts mansions, apartments, and then I was throwing them in other countries. I was starting to build up a network. And your wealth nowadays, especially nowadays, is your network. You're rolling 100%. I agree. Yeah. So my job was get a rich person to talk to me. That was it. It wasn't deep. It wasn't intelligent. It wasn't anything other than that pinpoint accuracy. I didn't want a poor person because, again, been there, know what it's like. And more than likely, you can't afford me. I just want a bunch of rich people. And so once I started throwing these parties and getting this name for the guy that threw these really cool parties, I would then go to like Mercedes or Asprey or Tiffany or Cartier or Porsche. And I'd go, Hey, how would you like to be in a room with 50 of the richest people in Macau or Hong Kong or Bangkok? And they'd be like, yeah, we'd love to. Great. For $20,000, I'll make it happen. So <laughs> I, I was charging it. the people to come into the party Usually I'd put it into a venue 
<clears throat> that could be sold, like a yacht's up for sale, a mansion's up for sale. And I'd say to the people, hey, any one of my people can afford your mansion, but I need it for the night to show them what it's like to have a party in a property that potentially they could experience. So I was then playing my game about That's how much of this party could I avoid paying for. So in the end, I got really good. I ended up throwing these elaborate parties, charging the clients, not paying for the venue, getting the sponsor. My bar, t- I'd even get drink sponsors come in. Wow. My parties ended up paying for the valet boy and the cleaning crew and the insurance. And wow. so I was minting it. I was getting paid three ways. And I was thinking, wow. I, was, I was thinking, this is really easy. And it's, as I say, it started off throwing parties. And then people would say to me things like, oh, you know, do, do, do you know anyone in Monaco? Because I'm going there for the Formula One. And I became, before the word concierge was used, I just became the man that can. You know, I was like the nice version of Ray Donovan until you didn't pay me. And then I was the nasty version of Ray Donovan. <laughs> the but, man that can, I love it. Yeah, I was just, you know, do you remember back, in, you know, you're, you're young, but uh, we we're both young, but back in the 80s in East London and probably in every major city, there was always the guy that you needed to know. There right. was, you know if you needed something, you go ask Jimmy. Right. You know, yeah. you ask. I was that man. And people would come to me and be like, look, you know, I need to go, I need to get into this premiere party, or I need to be able to meet up with this guy who's the head of a company because I think I can do an affiliate deal with him, or I need yeah. to go to Monaco. I'm trying to, you know, you know, look after this new girl I've met, uh, and I want to be in all the hot parties. I just became the man. And it grew. And as I say, it started off in Hong Kong. Then I moved down to Bangkok, did a lot of work in Asia with the Asian wealth. And then Russia kicked off, um, becoming the wealth area. Um, when that was kind of like changing over and I moved down to Switzerland, which was the capital of private banking, which again gave me, and at the time and still, still now, um, we never had any more than 300 clients. Now for any other company in the world, if you've got 300 clients, you're going bankrupt. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. But every single one of those were billionaires and owned things right. like countries. So it really didn't matter. So I was getting people going, oh, yeah, I want a birthday party. Can you fly Beyonce over to the Seychelles so that she can sing to me on my birthday party? Or I want to go and have some Italian food in Florence. And I would shut down a museum and have Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them at the feet of Michelangelo's David while they're eating their pasta. I just started dreaming and finding people that could afford me. And so I reverse engineered my concierge firm. And along the way, working for companies like the New York Fashion Week, the Ferrari Cavallino Classic, the Palm Beach Associate, um, Polo Association, um, the Art Fairs, uh, the Grammys, the Kentucky Derby, Elton John's Oscar Party, uh, all of these major groups, uh, Formula One, I then started consulting them. And I started saying to them, look, your party's good, but the way you market it to the people do you want to come or not? Because back in the day, and this could have been 10 minutes ago, no, it could be 10 years ago, but you'd go into a party and it was very stuffy, you know, because everyone was well to do and, you know, hi, how are you? It's a pleasure. No one wants that shit. They want to go to a party. They want to meet interesting people. They want to meet beautiful people in a beautiful environment. There's usually got a little bit of a twist or surprise that they can make their friends jealous about the following day, like having a certain celebrity suddenly just surprisingly appear or the party's supposed to be here, but it ends up being here and that location's better. So I started um, consulting with brands on how to speak better. And one of my aha moments was when the largest Ferrari, because I was working for Ferrari, and I met one of the largest dealerships in America. And the guy was in Monaco. And we were chatting, and we saw this guy walk past, and he looked scruffy. He looked scruffy as shit. And of course, in my head, I'm going, okay, is that guy rich or is he poor? You know, because you can't tell, especially now, you right. can't tell. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was in my head, I had got bored of this conversation I was having with the dealer because he, you know, I was bored of him. Um, so my, my mind was keeping engaged by checking out people who were walking past. And I was looking at this and the guy obviously knew I was bored. And I think he turned around and said something like, dude's probably got three Ferraris. And I said, what? 
And he said something profound to me. He said, the guy that comes into the store uh, on a Saturday with his girlfriend wearing a suit and tie, he can't afford my cars. The guy that comes in with sneakers and ripped up uh, cargo shorts on a Tuesday, he's probably on his third. Wow. And I was like, ah. Something yeah. to be said for that. Yeah. So, and, and so that was, that was where I came from, what I do, and uh, what I'm up to now. So, wow, that's pretty, that's really interesting. Uh, a lot, of, lot, definitely a lot to talk about. Um, so how, what, when you were way, way back then when you were at the CD bar and you, you, you know, you were people watching and just kind of trying to figure out the psychological piece behind um, what they were doing and, and uh, why they were there, so on and so forth. How did you get so good at realizing who had money, who didn't, and who you needed to talk to. And, um, and then how did you get connected with, I mean, how did you start? It sounds like you accidentally kind of fell into this, right? I think accident is probably a, 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 an over, a, an understatement. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, uh, so here, here I think is where my shining skill set came from. Um, I was an uneducated bricklayer and the traits that would mean that you wouldn't be successful, but I didn't have any fear. You see, nowadays, the kids, they've got Instagram and they're seeing every rapper, every celebrity, every influencer leaning up against a freaking car that they don't own. Mm -hmm. right. But to the kid that's 14 years old, you know, like my, my, my boy's gone to school this morning and for the past month, he's been going on about this kid that won a million dollars from playing Fortnite. 20 billion kids play Fortnite. One kid's become a millionaire. <laughs> now the kids don't want to go to school because they think their fortune is going to be made from playing on a computer game. So I never had anything like that. And here's, here's the basics. Back in the, oh God, I'm sounding really old, but we don't have to be. Technology moves so fast now. Old can be three years ago. Um, in the 80s and the 90s, as I was growing up, we did something called communicate. You know, I know if I upset someone in a bar because my nose was met with their knuckles. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I know if I piss someone off because he suddenly started to stance up and the shoulders went back and the chest came out, his eyes started, I'll be like, oh, shit, I'm going to get a pound in. So we knew right. about cause and effect. How many times at school did you say the wrong thing to the wrong person or that person's the, the cooler kid or that person's smarter? How did you know that? It wasn't because of a freaking Instagram posting. Mm -hmm. It was because you were within an environment. You were in the school classroom and you could see that the guy knew what you were talking about and you needed your homework done. You wouldn't turn left and ask me. You'd turn right and you asked them because you knew these things because you heard. You were in the moment. When I was the doorman, luckily I was in the moment. You know, yeah. get into that club. You had to talk to me. My yeah. trick needed to be, how can I make you want to talk to me after you're in? Now, as the doorman, he gave me a brilliant vision. I, th I still think now some of the best communicators in the world are not freaking psychologists or professors, are barmaids. Okay, you walk into a busy bar and a bartender, and I won't be sexist, male or female, they will look at you and within one nanosecond, they have to assert and they go, okay, oh, evening, gentlemen, how are you doing? You're out celebrating a good deal? What, what may I get you? And then you've got the group of girls that are out for a night of fun. And hey, ladies, you're out of it. The tone changes. Yeah. based, And you watch them. Okay, and I'm, this is my challenge to you all listening. Go to a busy upscale bar and watch how the mood and the presentation, the stancing, and by stancing, I mean your body language, changes as each bartender talks to a different set of people, a different bouquet of people, a different group. And they're very, very good at it. And on the door, I had to be the meathead. So I couldn't do that. But <laughs> once you were in, then I could turn around and go, hey, there's a private party coming up on Saturday. You know, I, I take it you guys are going. No, we're not. Where is it? Oh, it's at the mansion just down the road or there's a premiere. Because I was a good doorman, 
I got asked to work the door at all of these places. So I knew where they were all going to be. Mm-hmm. So I'd say to them, oh, yeah, there's a private, private party up on the point. Um, you guys interested in going? I could make a call. It's probably going to cost you 500 bucks each. And they'd be like, yeah, we're in. So then I'd just go back to the door for 10 minutes, stand there, do my job, then just walk back in and go, hey, I made a call, you're in, 500 each. And I'd get two grand out of it. That is hilarious. Oh. And so it, I realized it got bigger and bigger. And what, what ended up happening, I will tell you an exact aha story that really, at the time I was on a hustle. At the time, I thought, well, I'm getting paid a couple of grand to work on the door. I'm just going to tell the, uh, the, the people that are running the party, I got four friends coming along. And you could always do that. You know, yeah. you couldn't bring 40, but you could bring four. But I had, I had already learned I was doubling up on my night's money, you know? Mm-hmm. And wow. this was the big, this was the big aha that actually got me out of my sandpit. So I'm working on the door and I can actually, I can tell you the color of the car they turned up. This is so vivid as one of those kind of like, ah, I'm onto something. So I'm at the door. These four regulars had turned up, four good looking lads. They worked in a trading desk. They were everything I wanted to be. They always got the girls. I remember why I fell in love with these guys was because they had grabbed a bunch of girls. They were having a party on their table. The, uh, wait, um, the waitress turned up, the hostess turned up with that bill, uh, put the bill down. The first thing I noticed was the guy paying the bill turned around and made eye contact with her. You can tell a lot by the way people react to people in the service industry. Okay. And he turned around away from his party. He was like, oh, thank you so much. And then he gave her his credit card. Now, nothing unusual there. But he didn't check the bill. <laughs> That's I now were say that. bars and restaurants are known for just throwing an extra appetizer on there. Or once you've had twenty drinks, you don't know if it was twenty or if it was twenty-six. You know, so the bars are known for pumping up a couple of drinks on a drunk table. They're known for doing that. But this guy didn't care. For me, that was the richest man in the world. He had. He didn't care. Because he didn't have to quickly check his phone to make sure he had enough credit on the credit card. Right. I remember at the time walking through the grocery store. And again, I was uneducated at school, trying to do the math in my head to add up what was in my grocery basket so that it didn't get you know, denied at the counter. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember those days. Yeah. Um, but these guys didn't do it. So they turned up at my party. They turned up at my uh, club one night. And they said to me, oh, Steve, you're going down to the yacht party. And I said, oh, I, I, what yacht party are you talking about? And it was in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's an island, so it's got like about 40 harbors. Um, and I said, no, which one are you talking about? And they went, oh, it's just down here. And I said, you go in? And they went, oh, we, uh, we can't get in there. You know, and I'm like, oh, okay then. It was about a 10-minute leisurely walk from the edge of my club because the, the club area was on the edge of the harbor. So I said to my fellow meathead, I'm going to try something. You know, hold the door for me. And of course, I'm wearing a black jacket, black shirt. So I took my tie off, uh, walked down there, and there was a girl. And this is early in the evening. It's like seven o'clock in the evening. And it was a yacht party. And there was a girl on the gangplank with a a flip chart. She's just checking things and getting everything ready. The pie wasn't going to kick off for another three hours. And I just walked up to her and I said, hey, how you doing? You looking after the party? Now, she immediately got defensive. And she was like, yes, I am. I said, that's great. Hey, I don't want to get in, in, your, in your way because I know it's going to be, be, be a busy night for you. But um, we got four people coming down here tonight. I just wanted to confirm, do you want them here? And I can't remember the exact times, but I said, do you want them here at 8.30 before the rush? Or would you like them to turn up at like 10.30 once people have already got in there? What would be better for you? And then I shut up. The first thing she starts doing is going through her flip chart. Now, bear in mind, when you rewind this, I hadn't mentioned the names. I hadn't told her who was coming. But her instant reaction, and most people have an instant reaction, she starts flicking through this, uh, this chart, looking at all these names. And I said to her, hey, I'm not here to stress you. I'm actually here for the opposite. I wanted to make sure that it could go as smoothly as possible, because let's be blunt, you're going to be very, very busy tonight, and you're going to be quite happy tomorrow morning that it's over. In fact, let's also take it another step forward. These people are going to go into your party 
and they're going to enjoy themselves, but are they really going to say thank you to you? Sadly, I know they don't always do it. So with the four of them going in, here's a hundred bucks each. And I gave her 400 bucks. Now I was making two grand a month, sorry, two grand a week. So I've just given her 400 bucks, a big chunk of my pay. Yeah, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. All right. And I gave it to her and she was like, Oh, thank you. I said, don't worry about it. Tomorrow you can buy yourself a bottle of wine, a nice piece of food, and uh, just be thankful the night's over. Anyway, good luck with you. Enjoy the night. Um, do you want him here at 8.30 or 10.30? And she went, let's get him here at 8.30. And I went, thank you very much. And I went to turn away. Now, this was my gamble everything on red moment because she still didn't have the names of the people and they were not on the list. And so as I turned around, she said, oh, hang on a minute. What is your name? I said, oh, my name is Steve Sims. I just, I just look after a lot of affluent people. And I knew they were coming here. She went, what's their names? And I gave her the names. And this could have you know, gone you know, tits up real fast. But she just put the names on the front of her pad. And she said, ask for Melissa. I said, I'll tell them. No Thank kidding. Wow. And I went back, walked into the club, walked up to the boys and said, boys, I made a phone call. I always said I made a phone call. I didn't even own a phone. You know? <laughs> I made a phone call. You're in. I had to pull a couple of strings, but, you know, 500 bucks each, and you're down there. Get down there at 10.30. Again, without being flapping at all, they opened up the wallet and just threw out, they just threw out this two grand on the, um, on the table. And so I'd gone from losing 400 bucks to making 1,600. Went back to the door, gave my boy a couple hundred bucks, and we were all good. But I noticed then, Funny. these guys were incredibly affluent, incredibly good looking, so would have made the, the pages of the, the society pages look really good with them in it. Absolutely. But the one reason that they weren't going to that party that night was because they didn't want to be embarrassed to be declined. You see, most people, they don't worry about failing. They don't worry about people saying no to them. They worry about people seeing them fail, seeing them getting declined. You see, quite simply now, we're scared of other people's perspe perceptions of us when things go wrong. Shit goes wrong for me on a weekly basis. I fail on things so many times, and your opinion of those failings couldn't matter a toss to me, okay? Because they are education to me to get me to my next level. And no one's ever got good by just walking into it. You said I fell into this by accident. I fall down repeatedly. Now, my dad, and I'm sorry for ranting on here. No, please. My dad, big Irish lump, not the sharpest tool in the shed. But one of these days, he turned around to me when I was a little kid, and he said to me, son, remember this. No one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Well, and that stuck with me. So every time I fall down, I go, well, okay. I know where the, uh, I know where the hole in the path is now. Mm -hmm. um, and you never seem to trip on the same path twice. That's, that's so good. That's pretty awesome. Making $1,600. That, uh, so that was kind of your light bulb moment when you had those guys. That was my light bulb. And then okay. I started um, looking at where all the hot events were. And um, I got a name. I've always been very, very particular on the people I deal with. I'm a great believer that if you can vet the person coming through the front door, again, just like my door days, the couple of guys that are just looking for a couple of beers in them so they can get a bit handy that night, if you stop them walking in through the door, you avoid a fight for the night. Yeah, totally. So I had, I had that exact same mentality. If I can look at you and go, this ain't going to go right. I don't care how much money you've got. But if I stick your ass, your egotistical, let me selfie everyone to shit ass into my party, you're going to piss off my guests and my guests aren't going to come back for party number two. So I was, I'm always incredibly particular who I deal with and who I let through my front door. And you can do that now with your business. Never take on a checkbook, take on a client. So ignore how much money they've got because if they're an asshole to start with, it ain't going to get better over time. Right. Yeah. That's, wow. that's, that's, so, that's good. Steve, let me ask you, is there any, anybody else that you know of that's doing what you're doing at the level that you're doing it? Nah. No, you, you <laughs> yeah. are the man. You are the man that does it. It's just, 
it's one of these things that, um, you know, we got this little company kicking around now that's pissing everyone off called Amazon. Um, and it's basically taking over everything from, yeah. you know, grocery stores to mortgage companies. Amazon is, is trying to take everyone's business that operates on a transaction. Okay. Very, 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 very soon. McDonald's will not have any servers because it will be irrelevant. Okay. Because Amazon works on a transactional. You go along and you go, I want toilet paper. There's toilet paper It's delivered. Okay. Amazon doesn't think, create or dream. So with me, people come to me and they go, Hey, I want to meet guns and Moses. And I go, Oh, that's great. But we're not going to do that. And they're like, why? Well, no, I want you to tell me why. You know, I want you to tell me why it's so important for you to meet Guns N' Roses. And I want to get to the core of the reason behind it. Okay? Once I've got that core, then I can go, okay, meeting Guns N' Roses isn't going to do it. Let's get you a drum lesson with them on stage. <laughs> Let's get you to ride on the bus with them between concerts. Let's get you to be in a studio and jam with them all. You know, and those are the way, and I dream up these ideas. Again, Amazon, I can't be replaced mm -hmm. because of my creativity, my dream, my imagination, and my not willing to do anything that's dull. So clients come to me and I say to them, that's absolutely lovely, fantastic. I love the reasoning behind it, but we're not doing that. We're, we're doing gonna, it 10 times better. We, yeah, I've often said to people, and it's one of my that old little awesome. things, I say, well, that sounds great. But are you ever going to wake up at two o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat going, holy shit, I can't believe I did that. Would what you've just spoken about give you that wake up moment? And like shaking hands with your favorite rock star backstage when he's all sweaty. Yeah, that may be cool for a week, but three yeah. years later, you're going to like, oh, that was crap, you know? Right. So, right. Like the, um, the Florence, I don't know how much you know about what I get up to, but I had a client that was flying into Florence and he was trying to impress his, um, his fiance and her mum and dad. And he went, I really need a cool restaurant in Florence. And I said, well, what are you trying to do? You know, he wasn't trying to eat, you know, he, he was trying to show off. And I said, so what are you, I want to show her that, you know, and this guy was you know, very wealthy. Um, I want to show her that, you know, I'm capable of getting you know, in the doors. I want it, but he didn't like crowds. So he didn't want anything too big. I went, I gotcha. I gotcha. I took over the Academia de Galleria, which is the museum that houses Michelangelo's David. It's the most famous and iconic statue in the world. And I got the museum to shut down and put a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. <clears throat> Talk about wow. the, the, the perfect, we got a, a top chef to give them their own meal in a museum at the feet of the most iconic statue. That's amazing. Hopefully he got the parents' seal of approval after that. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> and we had to do a table of six because the fiance actually brought two girlfriends with her as well. That's why it went from four wow. to six That's... people. But halfway through that pasta, I actually said to them, we have a local singer that would like to come out and maybe serenade you while you're eating uh, your dinner. Would that be okay? And of course, I go, oh, yes, that is great. I brought out Andrea Bocelli to serenade them it's the smallest concert Andre's ever done in his life. Wow. <laughs> Six people. <laughs> and that's sitting there eating that pasta while the maestro himself is singing. It was an incredible night. But that's because that's I wild. took what he wanted and gave him what he needed. That's amazing. Wow. That, that's impressive. Yeah, and, I mean, I don't even have any words. That's, that's, <laughs> that's so cool. Listen, Steve, I, I mean, I know we could hear about you know, ask you questions about everything here. We're getting a little bit towards the end. Um, um, you know, I know shut up. no, no, you're, you're fine. No, it, it, it's, that was it's valuable. Everything you're yeah. saying is, is amazing. The experiences, uh, I mean, uh, you've got a book and I'm sure you write, uh, I'll let you talk a little bit about your book real quick. Um, and, and where we can get our listeners can get that book to, to learn more about what you do and how to be able right. to do what you do. Um, well, here's, here's the book. It's called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on my website, stevedsims.com. Um, but I was asked to do a book naming all the rich people that I dealt with. And I told them if I did that, I'd be dead by cocktail hour. <laughs> so then they asked me, would I write a book on how a bricklayer from London can be working with Richard Branson, Elton John, and Elon Musk? So it became more of a, 
how to self help motivating. But quite simply, it tells you how a thick headed Irish lad can suddenly be flying around the world dealing with the richest people in the planet. And here's the bottom line. If I can be doing it, you're already out of excuses. So that's how the book came about. I didn't think it would be successful. It became number one all over the planet and is currently just got bought out to be published in Russian. Um, but it's in Thai, Korean, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Chinese. It's on audio. Um, and as I say, now it's going to be turned into a Russian book as well. Really interested to see what it looks like in Russian. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Very Mike cool. Trump. I'm going to have to give myself a copy of that. And, yeah. Um, so, yes, all right. So we mentioned earlier, we got uh, time now for our segment called Moments okay. of Truth. We got seven questions for you. We're going to ask all our guests this. Um, and uh, we'll just dive right in. Who is your biggest success role model? My wife. She never lets failure or me get in her way. So it's got to be my wife. Beautiful. Your, uh, what's your biggest success? Well, being the man that I am and, and being known for doing what I say I'm going to do. So I think my word is my bond is probably my greatest accolade. Very cool. Okay. So on the opposite of that, what's your biggest failure? Oh, who cares? Um, you, you never count your failures. You count the successes that come from them. So, um, I, I don't know. Uh, I fail a lot. I fail often. I fail up. Wow, that's a good great, lesson great in and of itself. Yeah. So you 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 just educate yourself each time you do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What's your What's your favorite quote? Probably my dad's. Uh, no one ever died from uh, drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Completely agree with that one. What are some of your hobbies outside of uh, doing what you do? Well, I do live vicariously through my client's checkbook. So yeah, that kind of like gets me into a great deal of fun. Um, I'm sitting here at the moment in my garage. Um, I am exceptional at buying motorcycles and I'm crap at selling them. So I have a <laughs> garage here loaded up with everything from vintage Nortons, Harleys, Aprilias to Caddies. You know, there's, so I ride motorcycles very fast. Um, I barbecue and I drink way too many whiskey cocktails. Okay. okay. Sounds like a great day to me. Yeah. 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 What's the best business book that you've read? Uh, the next one. Um, I always just try to learn and learn and learn. And once I've read that book, then I go out searching for the next one. Um, so I, I don't know what the next book I'm going to grab, but you know, anything from Jay Abraham, Jay Abraham is very relevant again, because he talked about the old school style of marketing. And the more that we become very focused on digital and moving away from the client connection, as soon as you move away from a client connection and communication, you allow Amazon to come in. So I think anything by Jay Abraham is pretty good to get you back into front of uh, knowing the impact and the ROI on knowing a client and what they need and turning your client into a raving fanatic. Awesome. awesome. And last question here, Steve. If you had one key piece of advice that you could give to our listeners about achieving success, what do you think it would be? Um, be proud to fail. Um, because they're literally just the, uh, the little scars that will end up giving you the big bank account. So fail, fail often, fail a lot, and uh, be proud of that education. Great. That's good stuff. So, uh, Steve, as we wrap up here, what are, what are some of your wants and needs for your business and everything that you're doing? I'm good. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I just... I think um, at the age of 50, you know, you should start getting a little bit more content. Uh, when the book came out, I was very happy to see people changing. And so what I've really been enjoying now is I do a lot of speaking. I think we mentioned that um, we're over to Open Wide Entrepreneurs, uh, openwideentrepreneurs.com, which is an event I'm speaking at in South Boston, Virginia. I speak on about 22 stages all over the planet. I'm in Spain. England, New York, I'm all over the place. I spoke at Mexico and Thailand earlier this year. So I think my needs and wants are literally just to keep getting out there and educating people yeah. on how to actually do things. Um, so anyone that can you know, get on my Facebook, which is an entrepreneur's advantage by Steve Sims, or get into my website, you know, stevedsims.com, there's a lot of free advice that will quite simply get people out of their way. 99% of your problems are you. And if I can do something to change that and get you living well with no financial benefit to me, you know, I'm no saint. Um, I enjoy life and I enjoy spending money. 
but I want more people to realize that they've got to start building up relationships because as we said before, that's where the true wealth is. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Well, uh, Steve, that, that was awesome. Yeah. Every, I think you've added some great value, you know, just, just keep working, keep grinding, keep hustling and, and make those connections. Like you said, so uh, that wraps things up for today. You guys, he said it, reach out to him on Facebook, reach out to the group. Uh, there's lots of free information there. Um, you know, and if you're, if you fit the clientele that he has, uh, reach out to him and he will make your dreams come true. And then some. Um, so be sure to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash group slash wealth junkies and be sure to subscribe to our uh, daily web uh, podcast and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Have a great day. You've been listening to the daily wealth junkie show brought to you by CEO capital partners, CEO capital partners works with business owners and executives to build passive income through multifamily apartment syndications. For more information about how you can invest in quality multifamily real estate assets and build significant streams of passive income, visit us today at CEO capital partners.com.